So let us begin exploring the cardiovascular system and Tai Chi's effect on it in a slightly academic, but I hope this is a practical way. So let's start with this. Here is a picture of the heart uh, cut in half. The human heart has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles. And as you can see, the right atrium, that's where blood comes in from, the, from venous return. That's the blood that's coursed through the body and has, is oxygen depleted. And that, that goes down into the right ventricle. And then the ventricle pumps it out to the pulmonary artery where it goes to the lungs and gets reoxygenated. And then that reoxygenated blood comes back to the left atrium through the pulmonary vein into the left ventricle and boom, the left ventricle then sends it off to the body. And if you take a look, you see how the muscle surrounding the left ventricle is a little thicker. And that's so that it gives a powerful contraction that needs to send the blood throughout the body. So the heart has its own electrical system. So with no input from the central nervous system, the heart's going to continue beating. The neurological impulse originates in the heart and then initiates a coordinated contraction through the whole muscle. If the central nervous system sending no information and no hormonal signals to the heart, the heart's going to beat about 100 beats a minute. That's the baseline for the human heart without other input. So the parasympathetic nervous system, the nervous system often described as a rest and digest part of the nervous system. When that stimulates the heart, the heartbeat slows down. The parasympathetic nervous system is the part of your nervous system you stimulate when you relax. So relaxation will slow the heartbeat. And as, as we'll get into later, slowing the heartbeat reduces blood pressure. The sympathetic nervous system, you could describe that as the, the fight, freeze, or flight part of the nervous system. When that gets stimulated, then that triggers an increase in heart rate. So when stress hormones are triggered through stressful situations, heart rate goes up and blood pressure goes up. So then let's go downstream from the heart. And here we've got the depiction of the circulatory system. So the blood comes out of the left uh, ventricle into the aorta and then off into a network of arteries. And then that, they keep branching off, branching off, branching off until you get to capillaries. And capillaries eventually get down to where a thickness of a single red blood cell. And then that's where the offloading of oxygen, the onloading of CO2 and the exchange of nutrients and metabolic by byproducts happens. And then those collect into tubes that turn into veins. And then the veins pour the blood back to the heart. So arteries have the tube is surrounded by smooth muscle that contracts and expands. The veins also have smooth muscle, but they expand and contract less. Veins also have valves in them, so blood does not come back upstream. So it's like one-way travel in the vein. You need to get back to the heart. Two important ways to help blood get through veins back to the heart. One is called the muscular pump. And when a muscle contracts, squeezes the veins and helps get the blood back to the heart. So muscular contraction and relaxation helps promote venous return. And then that fills up the heart again and helps to pump blood to the lungs and then oxygenated blood back out of the rest of the body. There's another important venous return mechanism, the respiratory pump. Deep diaphragmatic breathing promotes venous return from the abdominal region. So if you are working the big muscles of the body and breathing deeply, you're maximizing your contribution to supporting venous return. And, you know, that's what you're doing when you're doing Tai Chi, breathing deeply and working your legs, hips, arms, shoulders, really the whole body. I want to get into arteries a little bit next. So here we've got a depiction of an artery and then a blow up of the wall of the artery. And on the inside of the arteries surrounding the tube is the endothelium. And it's about a single cell thick layer of tissue that's fascinating. The endothelium is a very bioactive tissue. So it has a lot of functions. And one function that is really, really interesting and very relevant for us, the endothelial cells have receptors on them that sense pressure from blood flow. And when that pressure increases, 
the endothelial cells release a substance, nitric oxide, that then diffuses into the smooth muscle next to it and relaxes it. Aerobic exercise increases the heart rate, increases blood flow, and triggers the endothelium to start a mechanism that relaxes the artery wall. Some important terms for what we're getting into next. This relaxing of the artery wall, we call vasodilation. The opposite is vasoconstriction, the tightening of arteries, the shrinking of the radius of the tube, and several associated consequences of that that we'll get into. So, and here's what happens when our arteries vasoconstrict, when they tighten, what happens? The same amount of fluid flow going through them uh, increases the pressure inside the artery. So if we are looking for a source of why our blood pressure may be high, a measure of vasoconstriction in our arteries is usually associated with it. Conversely, when our arteries relax, vasodilation, then we get improved circulation, we get decreased blood pressure, and then improved functioning of all the things that happen when blood moves around better. So leading to a question, what contributes to vasoconstriction? There's a number of things to do. A couple of big ones that we can influence are what we eat. Increased vasoconstriction is associated with high sodium intake, high processed food intake. Changing that kind of dietary element can affect vasoconstriction and the resultant uh, increase in blood pressure. That's why a low sodium diet is recommended to manage hypertension. And then stress. Stress affects our arteries in a couple ways. First, the stress hormones trigger the smooth muscle surrounding the artery to contract, to vasoconstrict, which can be very functional if you're in a survival situation. But we rarely are today. And think about when you're in a survival situation, then you're either running or fighting, you know, your big muscles are working. But that's not how most of us experience stress today. We get the stress and the associated hormones and we're sitting. So then what happens is vasoconstriction occurs, blood pressure goes up. And there's no associated muscular action to moderate that. And then stress is also associated with tightening of tissue. The way we sit and hold ourselves, you know, our shoulders get tight, our backs get tight, our necks get tight, our hands, feet, all that gets tight. And that contraction of tissue also contracts all the associated soft tissue. And that includes the arterial tissue, a combination of both physical stress and tension that we hold in our body and the hormonal action leading to vasoconstriction reduces our blood flow and increases our blood pressure. Conversely, what contributes to vasodilation? There's a number of factors, but two big ones that we can influence are exercise and relaxation. First, Relaxation practices, whether it's breathing, meditation, tai chi, qigong, yoga, whatever, there's a range of practices that contribute to relaxation. What those do is decrease the secretion of stress hormones. It then decreases the stress hormone input into vasoconstriction, allowing those arteries to relax. Relaxation also stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, which will slow the heartbeat down further decreasing the pressure going through the system. When it comes to managing blood pressure, relaxation has a lot going for it. 